Hi, and welcome to another episode of Dungeons and Degrees. My name's Adrian. And I'm Alex. And today we have a wonderful guest, Ray, of Dinner and a Game. Uh, over on Twitch, uh, the website's in progress up mm -hmm. right now one of the two <laughs> sorry it's it's in progress in i'm progress. hoping to get it up in the next couple of weeks before we go to gen con yeah oh, gen con something else we can talk about mm, um and i want to talk about the huge community that um ray and others have created um and what you know what what kind of effort does it take what kind of thoughts and intentions and ideas does it make take to create such a great community because i've had my share of games at dinner a game and all welcoming they all have their uh you know make sure everything's safe they ask for the necessary things like uh, headshots for promos and things like that and it's just a very welcoming space and i absolutely love it um yeah tell me about dinner a game what's the i guess what for those that that don't know like, like me what is it? The, what can they expect? Oh, well, uh, number one, uh, Dinner in a Game is, I always call it like a nerd space community. Um, our, our main focus is TTRPGs, actual plays uh, that we produce or that our friends produce. Um, the community itself is based around um, positivity and inclusivity. Um, we have people from all walks of life. The only thing you will not find is, unfortunately, and I say unfortunately for a very specific reason, is the, you know, the conservative community doesn't usually get along in our sites. Um, so you won't find, you definitely won't find any Trump supporters. And you find very few people who hold conservative values. Um, because we are massive supporters of the LBT, LBGTQIA community. Um, we believe completely in trans rights. Uh, and, and you know we're as as i've put out on our facebook and our, our, our other social media sites um uh, we are completely a cab um so <laughs> if if anything if anything like that comes up and it and in it in their community it usually is a situation where that person got invited by someone we don't know you know don't know as well and so we took away we took away all invite rights from our general discord audience only only our only our mods now have invite rights but we still get people who slip in on some of the old uh old websites we used to have up and stuff like that oh, so. so those links are still there yeah lingering yeah yeah, yeah. so what we, we do we basically do our best to make sure that the community has the same ideology across not across the board but the same general ideology and outlook that way that there may be disputes inside the community but it's disputes with people who are fundamentally in agreement with most of their base beliefs right so you heard it here first folks i am not a cop i've been i've been go. cleared <laughs> um yeah no, i might be though so. <laughs> <laughs> maybe <laughs> I mean, all those <laughs> things that Red said, totally down with it, a hundred percent. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. We Ray, those values. Ray, no, mm -hmm. Ray, opposite. Just opposite. <laughs> opposite. <laughs> all right, no problem. Yeah, no. So I, I, I got away. I got I got away with saying a cab uh, mm -hmm. when I'm around children and stuff uh, by saying defund Paw Patrol. So just in case you're curious, defund Paw, Paw Patrol. Same same vibe. Got it. <laughs> it's actually brilliant. <laughs> I was just like little kids. I was like, I know what Paw Patrol is. <laughs> yeah. But I will. But, okay. So even hmm. with the Paw Patrol. So like, really, what is the goal of Paw Patrol? It is to like help their community. And like they use all of their resources to help their community. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like Chase, who is just fighting Police crime. Dog. Police mm -hmm. dogs? But um, just kind of focus on it. So I don't know. Maybe don't defund Paw Patrol, but make like make make our communities more like Paw Patrol. Yep. Take the Fund take Paw the Patrol. take the budget and actually use it to help the community, oh, yeah. rather than yeah. rather than try, that, rather than try and uh, you know <clears throat> suppress portions of the community that you may may or may not agree with. And um, yeah. Yeah. It's, there's there's much worse things that I could say, but I'm not going to. Oh, we appreciate both <laughs> of those safe. things. You could say worse. We could say, we totally agree, I was going to you know? say. <laughs> but today we're going to yeah. focus on community. 
There you go. Yeah, community is better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, how did this become? How, oh, how did um, it start? So, I've had the dream of doing something like this since I was. So <laughs> I'll I'll change it up a little bit. I in tooth I, in like the nineties, late nineties. I was one of those people who had a TV show on uh, the public access channels, and it was it was called Peace of Mind. It was just it was actually more focused on the music scene because the other guy who was doing the show did the show with me had a band, and we go out and I take their live performances and then we would talk about the performance as we you know as a little talk show, a little point of topic, and then we would go out into other branches and other things that we talk about as well, and so. It was kind of like a venue coverage situation. And so that's kind of where I got my taste of actually wanting actually to kind of form communities around niche hobbies and niche niche likes and everything like that. And so in 2018, I was living in San Antonio, Texas, and I had, I had a regular game group, uh, and I also ran Adventures League at a game store uh, that got very popular. We had like a... We had at least 10 tables every every saturday and um so it was it was really going well and because of that though i met a lot of different gamers and i kind of said you know i i found the ones that that reflect my type of gaming this heavy on story heavy on storytelling um in-depth character backgrounds and i said i want to create something to put out there as a podcast and so I started talking to people, inviting people, and we started doing dinner in a game then. My wife actually came up with a name because she says, well, every Saturday we just invite people over to our house and have and have dinner and then play a game. So we're dinner in a game. And so uh, that was basically the gist of it. And so we began to just go through and record the sessions. And that was kind of ha And then I go down and edit them, all the sessions into like one hour episodes and release those as a podcast. And so everything we did at that point was very, very basic and rudimentary. Um, and as we as we kind of learned what we needed to go along, we started improving equipment. We started, you know, ch doing ma major changes. And then uh, I got a really good job offer in Houston, Texas. So we moved, which kind of nixed all that completely. Because um, at this point, we weren't doing anything like with in a, a, with a digital space and a digital right. footprint. It was all in person. In Houston, we began gathering people. We, we started gaming in another local gaming store. Um, same thing kind of fell out, but this time we went video. And th this is actually didn't happen. That 2000, uh, 2018 and 2019, we're in San Antonio. 2019, we moved back to Houston. And then as everything kind of boiled out, we were starting to get people together and then COVID happened. And also during COVID, I also got laid off from my job and we ended up having to move to the Fort Worth area with my parents uh, because we basically had one of those massive setbacks. Um, I was out of work for like six or seven months and we blew through all our savings and everything like that. The, the company we rented from was really, really cool. They helped us not get evicted so that we wouldn't have that in our record. They That's let so us get good. out of the lease. Yeah, well, it was 2020. Yeah. It was because yeah. we were saying, look, we know that we could like stop paying rent. Well, we, we, it wasn't before the rent thing happened. But we right. were like, you know, we're, we're not gonna be able to pay rent. I haven't been able to find a job. COVID's here. We don't know what we're gonna do. And they were like, do you have some place to go? And I was like, yes. And I was like, well, if we can give you one month to get the house in the proper order and move out and we will terminate your lease rather than evict you. Mm, okay. And it was just because we actually called them and talked to them yeah. and worked with them and everything like that. And they were very, very cool about it. But so then we moved up here. Um, I got, oddly enough, March of 2020, I got a, like a dream job offer. I got to work from home. Uh, I made the most highest salary I've ever made in my life still to date because I still work for the same company. Um, I... Uh, so and that was like amazing and like we I got that put this way I got that job in March and we rented a new house and moved in and I didn't pay I didn't do a thing I paid other people to do everything because I, I all of a sudden all of a sudden had this massive disposable income and I was like nope we're hiring movers we're doing everyone's gonna do it That's I'm not gonna dream. do nothing 
Yeah, I am old and I hurt, and someone else is carrying the heavy stuff. <laughs> and so we moved in. We moved into the Fort Worth area, and because it was still COVID, mm -hmm. we wanted to game, but we couldn't. There was right. nothing we could do. So that's when we started getting back in touch with some of the people in our Houston groups, and we got everyone together. We started doing digital games, and. That's when I put together all the pieces of the puzzle to start recording those games and finding out what we needed to do for that. The first group we had went very, very, very well as far as the gaming side of it. But there were some big personal issues and the group had a massive falling out that was completely my fault. I did not handle the stress of running everything very well. Um, I got really paranoid. I felt like people were trying to take control of it away from me, even though I was the one saying, you guys can have a portion of the show if you come on and do something. Because so, I have this concept of no one should give you anything for free. This, there should be some kind of reciprocation. If they're creating content that they're no longer going to own and it's going to be on my website and it could possibly provide me a means of profit in the future or currently, then they should be compensated. So the reason, the way I originally did this was we were kind of dividing the the, uh, the dinner and the game itself up into uh, shares. And it was going to be like an ownership, uh, uh, ownership thing. And the only thing my wife and I kept for ourselves is we kept like 51% majority of shares and we had a veto. So that was that was it. And it was, it was kind of really a rough rudimentary structure. We didn't even have it documented. But a bunch of stuff happened. And like I said, the group had a massive falling out. Completely my fault. Um, actually, kind of funnily enough, because it happened in our Discord, I have never removed the chat history from our Discord. So if you have, and I let everyone have the ability to read history. So you can literally go back into the beginning of our Discord and our general chat channel, and you can see the falling out happen. And you can see, w you know, how, what I did, how I was in the wrong. And that's mainly because I wanted full transparency. Because uh, anyone else coming back in, you know, the concept of being human gets really lost in these endeavors because you sit there and you try and do something that is very difficult. And if you have a failing on a personal level, when I had that failing and I, fa and I basically imploded and destroyed everything, it was very much a situation of, I knew I did it. I, I knew I did it. I knew I was being correct for doing it. I came back. I, we, you know, I apologize to everyone. Some of the people we still talk, some of them we don't anymore. Um, and it basically ended up being a situation of, at this point in my life, I wasn't ready to do this, and I fell apart. When I started, and then, like, about a, in 2020 two-ish that's when we decided we were going to try again and or I decided I was going to try again we went through the process of kind of uh, building up a new cast I met a lot of people on TikTok because that's where I kind of got, uh, found a lot of RPG players and mm -hmm. became friends with them talking to them in their in their TikToks and everything like that and so I put together the first group which is still playing right now which is Kingdoms of Mist, our Wednesday night game. It's a 5e game. It's been going on since the beginning of DAG, so it's three years old, a little over three years old now, and they're going to be ending the campaign this year before the holidays, and they're going to end it at 20th level. Oof. So, and we played from first. We played from That's first so level fine. on up. Yeah. What a dream. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and oh, the funniest thing is, Milagros, one of our players, she plays uh, Utopia in the game. This was her first ever tabletop role-playing game experience at all. This is her first D&D &D game ever at all. And she did it all on the stream. <laughs> That's an interesting what a like, documentation right. of like, I don't know what I'm doing to you. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> no, Milagros is like, I still don't know what I'm doing, oh. but I love this game. <laughs> so yeah, and that's kind of like the whole gestation of Dinner and a Game's progress. And now I am... Because 
I'm incredibly lucky. I have the ability to do things like compensate people for their time. Um, I have an administrative assistant, uh, Madness Diamond, uh, Diamond Lynn, and they are basically they, they it's part time. They they we pay ten we pay them ten t for ten hours a week, and they go through and they help coordinate our schedule and everything like that. And they work with uh, people who are having issues with scheduling. But, you know, that is something that Dinner in the Game pays for. Uh, well, I should say I pay for, but I'm Dinner in the Game, so, um, and my wife. And so we pay for that out of pocket. And then Ren, Renowned, is our current only paid GM. Before Renowned, we had a Star Shark Stories, M. She was a paid GM for about a year. And uh, 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 Ivy Shadow, Game Raider Girl, she was a paid GM for about nine months. Um, a lot of stuff happened in the next couple of years. Like both my parents passed away and uh, this is actually my parents' house. Um, we inherited the house. And so we moved out here. Everything changed. When we moved out here. We took, we had to take about a month off, a month or two off when all that happened. Um, and it happened like in the course of six months, both my parents died. Um, and so it was a very difficult time and the one of the big things about it that made it a little less difficult was having this community because even though i wasn't able to be as big a part of the community during that time period people were stepping up and saying do you want me to run something do you want me to do something for you so you can keep having content coming out mm -hmm. and you know half the time i was like no, 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 that's just, we're just going to keep it dead air. The other half of the time, I, they, were, they were like Ivy or, or, or M or someone like that yeah. who already had access to our accounts and everything and could log in. Um, they would be they would be the ones doing things, and I would just be like taking care of the estate and helping my brothers and getting everything ready. And so knowing that the community was there and was willing to support us made it, made this like, solidified this for me as something that I never really wanted to ever have descend into that situation again where, you know, it became too much work. Mm -hmm. And it's actually why I ended up hiring Diamond, because I needed to basically take some of that weight off my shoulders. Um, one of the things that we do on DAG is we try and run as much content as possible to allow us to be always broadcasting at the affiliate level. Um, mm. If you if you know what the Twitch affiliate requirements are, you have to do X amount of hours a month yeah. and X amount of days. I think it's in a two week period that you have to be streaming. Yeah. And so, you know, we do six games. We do one, two, three. I do three nights a week. Ren does one night a week. And so that's four separate shows. Right. I actually run an alternate game on Friday, so it's technically five. But it's it happens during the same time period. Right. And so, and each one of the shows are like at least three hours long. And so there, it's all that content, it's always coming out. And so that's one of our things we kind of do as a, try as a commitment to our community is always providing them with a variety of content to be able to choose from. Um, if they don't like D and D we have world of darkness. If they don't like world of darkness, Ren runs one shots all the time. I run stuff like, you know, I have cyberpunk red one Friday and the walking dead the next Friday. It's all, all there to do, give as much back to the community as possible in that. Um, and we also do a lot of charity events. Um, like we just did a thousand dollar fundraiser for PCRF like a month and a half ago. Um, we are going to be setting up another fundraiser soon. Um, and so it's, you know, we're just doing everything we can to do as much community work as possible. I will say this on our, for the last cast that I had, the very, the cast that kind of fell apart, yeah. we did a fundraiser for, uh, uh extra life. Yeah. And, and we raised $5,000. <laughs> Nice, nice. So nice. yeah, that's probably our the most successful one so far, but that's because we made that one a contest and everyone got divided into teams. <laughs> it was just like 
there was there was definitely some one upsmanship on that. So <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. No, so that's, that's basically, you know, that's basically the the, the entire way things happen. Mm -hmm. It was both a combination of me wanting to do better as a person and someone who was trying to create this community and be more devoted to actually being more concerned about the community than anything else. Mm -hmm. And then me and then the community itself coming together to support each other. And so that's the that's the best thing you can ever wish for. I feel like like the response of you kind of having to take the time off shows the community that you built is there for you as well mm -hmm. and therefore, you know, the purpose of DAG. So, I mean, it seems like you did very well in choosing who and what kind of messages and, you know, those kinds of things to be put out. So, bravo, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the whole that's kind of was the other point of the whole what we went through in the past mm -hmm. what that also helped us do is refine what our goal was and what our message is mm -hmm. and like our, our our slogan is we always save you a seat at the table right and it's basically supposed to commit convey that you know as long as you come to us in good faith and you're bringing something to that table whether it be your creativity your support your 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 love your compassion whatever as long as you're bringing something positive to that table you will always be welcome at that table we don't expect everyone to come in and commute contribute like a you know, ton of stuff in the every single second of the day but we just want you to come in and be a positive contribution to the community itself right that's amazing um with these individuals that are running games, you have, it sounds like four to five, you said, right? Uh, uh, I run most of them right now. Uh, Ren is the only other paid GM we have right now. Mm -hmm. um, we do have people that run one shots. And the way we kind of rig everything up is um, the paid GMs are the ones who run campaigns. Right. Like Ren is right now writing his campaign. So he's doing one shots until he gets that. And of course, the pay GMs are based on what we can afford to pay. Mm -hmm. um, I will, and I'm always transparent with this too. Whenever I start putting out feelers for pay GMs, Dinner in a Game pays all of our staff the same rate. They make thirty dollars an hour. Our Diamond makes thirty dollars an hour for her part time work. Uh, Ren gets thirty dollars an hour for broadcasting. Uh, so every hour that he's on is three dollars. Mm -hmm. And the reason we do that is because. Diamond, we do it because she does. A, it's a lot of work. Oh yeah, and Organized it's and it's it's, so it's, it's and it's high level. It's high level administrative work. And Diamond is also our like kind of our PR person. She's the one who reaches out to people to build relationships with other game companies and stuff like that, and other streams and podcasts and people. And so Diamond does a lot of work for that thirty dollars an hour. So mm -hmm. we uh, that's completely absolutely worth it. Ren, the reason we pay Ren thirty dollars an hour, even though he only like streams for, like three hours is because I know that from being a GM forever, I know that, <laughs> that that three hours, you can multiply that times three in the amount of times I usually prep. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, you at least at least doubled. So, and plus also when Ren starts a new campaign, like a full-on mm -hmm. campaign, we pay them for eight hours just flat. And that's without them being on stream. And mm -hmm. that's because building a campaign is usually world building and world building is intense. Oh, so yeah. we pay for eight hours of time there and then we pay for their hourly wage. And um, it is getting to the point where we want to bring on more content. I want to take a step back from yeah. actively creating content. And I want to, number one, give other GMs a chance to come in and create content. And I want to a chance to do more production side things mm -hmm. because on Ren's streams, I've been doing the producing and I've been in there when the audience and just trying to drive the audience forward. And we have had a much better engagement. We've had uh -huh. much, we've had conversations in the audience about what's going on stream. Cause I can keep the chat focused on things. And so that has been a huge godsend. So being able to have a live producer in the audience and working the audience and making sure that people are engaging mm -hmm. um, is it's outstanding. And so I'm like, I would rather, 
I would I love running games. It's my absolute love. I don't even really like playing that much. Mm-hmm. I like running. And so, but at the same time, I used to only run one game every two weeks. When I was, you know, in, in what I'd say normal gaming spaces, <laughs> I would be running one game every two weeks for my friends. Mm-hmm. I could still do that now and not not put it on stream. Mm-hmm. And then I could have all these other games running as well. And if I can cut back the number of days, the number of things I'm actually running, that reduces the amount of time I have to spend doing my own prep and everything like that. So it's just a much better overall situation. And it's something that I would like to see because it would help Dinner and Games overall quality and production value. And that's what I want to see go, get better. Um, we're doing, uh, uh, for the month of September, we're going to do a month long, basically, subathon. We're calling it, we're just going to call it a fundraiser. Mm-hmm. And we're going to start doing it every quarter. And it's basically, we're going to do a fundraiser to, for that month. And that fundraiser is going to be set towards building a budget for a quarter. So, like, the September fundraiser is going to be building out the budget from the last quarter of the year. And right now what we're doing is we're working on a complete budget to see how much money we need to raise to pay everyone's salaries mm-hmm. and to pay for, you know, anything we need extra, like website stuff and everything like that. And we've been building out a line of T-shirts and stuff like that <laughs> to actually try and bring in revenue as well. But the biggest issue is I'm always running or doing administrative stuff for the website. Diamond's always doing administrative stuff. Um, oh, and we pay for all our own artwork and we license it. Yeah. So we, we do hire a lot from the local community. Like I just set out a commission uh, to, I've said to Diamond and Ren because they know a lot of people are artists. And it's basically, we're gonna take all the headshots we have of all the cast members for DAG, mm-hmm. the, uh, the full-time cast members. And we're going to do a group I'm going to have a group uh, art piece of art done with everyone in it. So and cool. then that's going to become one of our banners. So, and so, you know, that's that, you know, that type of stuff we, I want to, I'm going to, of course, paying that out of pocket, but that's one thing I want to be paid for by the stream. I don't want the, I don't care if the stream makes a profit. I just want to cut down on my personal expenses now <laughs> <laughs> and have the stream maybe start trying, maybe start supporting itself. Right. And and then if it does that, then we can do things like I can step back from doing that and doing more production. And then we can bring out other paid GMs. And it's wonderful to give people an opportunity to make more, make more than just content. Make something that makes them feel like they're really being appreciated. Mm-hmm. And we're a capitalist society right now. Yeah. It's a capitalist hellscape. But being able to tell someone, hey, I'd love you to run a game I show. And they're like, oh, I just don't have the time and everything like that. It's like, well, I can give you 30 bucks an hour. Yeah. If it'll help. Because, like, that time is probably because they have to do something else to make sure that ends meet. So if they Mm -hmm. can do something that, one, probably alleviates them and just be more creative instead of just work, work, work. Mm -hmm. Putting that money towards that allows them to like okay i can free up a little bit of financial heartache if i do this thing i love and i also do like have fun doing it as well yeah yeah and the other big thing about it is um one of the other things we have in our contracts is that the people who create the actual content the only thing dinner in a game retains the rights to is the video rights to anything created on our for our stream or on our stream the rights to the characters stay with the players. The rights to the world, if they do homebrew, stays with the GM. Um, so if they ever leave, because like way back in the day, we there was a well when we first started this new 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 mm-hmm. new, new cast, there was a group of people that I met. Uh, uh, Marcy is one of them uh, from TikTok, and they were trying to do streaming on TikTok, and it wasn't going very well uh, because they just didn't have the equipment. Right. And so I told them, it's like, hey, I love the stories you're trying to tell. I will give you a platform. I will build out your overlays. I will produce your show while you're live. I will do everything that you need to be able to do it. All you have to be able to do is join the phone call and run your game. And we did that for them. And they went and they spent they spent six months streaming for us and with us. Um, and they basically ended up 
cr we created them their own channel, I guess you'd say, in the fact that it was on our channel, but it was all their own content, all their own games. I never, I didn't even like play on any of their games. I literally was just producing games and that's mm -hmm. it. And so they had their own content. They were starting to develop more games and everything like that. And what ended up happening is they ended up finally, they, they all pulled together, got some money vested in a, a computer that could do it. And they start, they started their own channel called the lab, and the lab experiments in gaming. And so, you know, everything that they did, they did on their own. The only thing we did was provide them a platform when they didn't have one. And that was the entire purpose. And I wanted to start doing that with more people, but the mm -hmm. more I kept on thinking about doing it, the more I was like, it's cool because I give people a platform to launch off of. Right. But it also is kind of rough because it puts that expectation of, you're going to go out on your own, so you need to be thinking about how you can <laughs> do that. Yeah. And that is... That's a, okay. <laughs> the box I stream to six channels every stream. Right. Because I pay for a service called Restream.io. And Restream gives you the, the ability to stream to five channels by itself. And then I have the TikTok Live software that I run separately. And, oh, seven channels, sorry. And I stream to TikTok Live from the same overlay mm -hmm. and then we have a feature on our patreon where our patreon subscribers can get access to the live call that because there's a chat in the live call and it's usually all the insane planning that the play players are doing behind the scenes and all the dick jokes that are happening behind yeah, the scenes. Yeah, yeah. they're all mm -hmm. in the chat and so because you'll see you'll see the group just like breaking up like when i'm doing a monologue or something like that the group will just lose their shit on the side grounds just covering their mouths laughing their asses off mm -hmm. and it's usually because i said something and they've turned it into some kind of innuendo joke so and it's, it's one of their favorite things to do and so you get the patreon pa 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 patrons get to see the chat and can you know and watch the chat live as it happens um and that's and i do that through uh stream and I send that up to a separate private uh, YouTube channel, and then I send that YouTube channel to freaking Patreon. <laughs> the, the the links we have to go to get content, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> the the box that I have is powerful enough to do that all by itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I literally invested like almost five k in the box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just like you know, people can't. Oh, not everyone can do that. Right. And but of course mine is above and beyond cuz I do so much. Right. Just getting a box stick and stream is still going to be like 2k. Mhm. Mm and it is very hard for a lot of people who create content to be able to do that. So that's why I kind of wanted to present that opportunity to people. Mm -hmm. But it makes me just feel like either one I'm pressuring them to try and raise that type of money or two it's it's just me profiting too much off of someone else's hard work and not giving them what I think is proper compensation. Yeah. And it's because I'm Catholic and I feel guilty about everything. <laughs> well, no, uh, I think it runs I, deep. <laughs> I actually I'm going to I'm going to counter this hmm. because okay. I don't know if you've made this tie yet. I don't know if you've thought about this. But your background is in, like, a public TV space. Mm -hmm. And if we know one thing about, like, NPR, PBS, like, the, the, like, those channels, those organizations are run by donations. So really what it sounds like is you were, like, making a PBS, KERA, I don't know what the, the other, you know, KERA is in the Dallas, right? Um, yep. You're creating that, but for for TTRPG. That's what we're, we were trying to do, yes. And yeah. now it comes down to the fact that, you know. Yeah, so now you're doing a fall campaign. Uh, <laughs> so every other 10 minutes, we're going to hear, like, phones ringing in the background. <laughs> and then, like, 
the different merch Dad options you get at the different, <laughs> yeah, the different mm-hmm. tiers. Oh, you get a signed copy of whatever. If you're <laughs> donating within the next, the next five minutes, everybody's going to get the like special tote bag. But we just got a match donation. So for the next thousand dollars, we're going to be matched by, you know, <laughs> Bill and Melinda Gates. Like it's, that's what. <laughs> Do you that's have the numbers? I, I need to call them still. So. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can't I can't imagine why you haven't. Like <laughs> this definitely sounds right up their alley. But yeah. I, I there's not guilt there. It is a passion for like like there's a passion for um mm-hmm. like being a patron of the space. Like it it's not necessarily that you are benefiting off of other people other people's work because you know you you support it you bring them in you're not just saying oh i see that you're doing this really cool thing why don't you come over to my space and then take all of the rights of their games and their characters and of their stories um i think i think you so what it sounds like here's my therapizing for the day sounds like you feel guilty doing all of this but honestly you have created such a wholesome system that really uh, that little part of your brain can go fuck itself, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's that's usually how I overcome it. I'm just like, oh, just shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're running. I mean, like to get the affiliate status on Twitch, you gotta like that's gotta be your fucking job. And for a lot of us, I would love that to be my job, but it's not gonna be my job. One, because I'm introverted as fuck. And I don't want to interact with people like that. Like, I don't necessarily want to be perceived all the time for that, that status. But if you run it as a collective, then the, the burden is less uh, felt throughout all of the creators. And, like, if there's one lesson we learned in COVID, it was that we need a community. If we don't have a community, we all fall apart and die. <laughs> now, you've got this community that you built. And and you guys are all supporting each other. And, like, yeah. So next time I hear you say that you feel guilty about taking that thing, like, I'm going to come. I, I'm i not far away from you. I will come punch <laughs> you in the throat. <laughs> well, to be honest, you are probably are far away from me because I don't actually live in Fort Worth. I live out in the sticks. <laughs> I drive to Keller to eat empanadas. From I used to live I in live. Keller. You're not too far away from me to punch yeah. you in the throat. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't My feel like any punch in the throat. Is too far away, right? For like, is normal, that the like... one by the game? Is that the empanada place by the game store in Keller? Oh my God, Del Campo. Yes. Yeah. Yep. We used to get empanadas from there all the time. We used to live in Keller. They're so good, aren't they? Mm-hmm. <gasps> mm-hmm. Yeah, that's. And did you know that they're not like standard uh, Mexican empanadas from Mexico? Uh, no, they're actually they're, they're actually from Ecuador. Yeah, uh, yeah, I thought yep. Argentina, but Ecuador. Uh, like Argentina, that. it might have been Argentina. Yeah, yeah. It's so okay. they're the, they so have they have a lot, lot of it on the wall. Yeah. yeah, they have a lot of empanadas I never even tried, so I was just oh like, my God. <gasps> I, am at I haven't home. gone I, yet. <laughs> I haven't gone yet. Out here where I live, there mm-hmm. is a place, and I don't know if how if a, uh, how much of a connoisseur of Mexican food you are, but do you know what a gordita is? Uh, yeah. I do know what a gordita is. Soy. I, I have think. not. Yeah, I have not <laughs> had a gordita since like Fiesta in San Antonio in like two thousand uh, two thousand and five, because no one serves them, and they're like yeah. only like a they're only like a Fiesta thing. There is a yeah. restaurant out here that makes fucking authentic gorditas. And I was just like, I'm, <gasps> I've gone I'm gonna home. Need, <laughs> I'm going to need those details. We don't have to do it now to dox anybody here. Oh, yeah, here, absolutely. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm going to need those details because if there's one thing I'm looking for, it's a good meal. Oh, God, yes. God, yes. Okay. Uh, and I will say, I can't even say what little town I live in because it's so small that I would literally dox myself. <laughs> See? Yeah. No, it's fair. I, that's why we're not. We're going to, yeah. after we're done recording, uh, we're going to. We're gonna not even we're not even gonna share it with the the people. I'm so sorry, dear listener. Um, maybe <laughs> I will, and then okay. maybe I'll say, "Oh my god, this gordita place! It was amazing. I don't know how I found it." Yep. <laughs> we'll LOL. To to, 
a bunch of other places as well to like get the scent off to make sure no one's like which one it is yeah the last thing i'm looking for uh for mexican food wise is a place that serves more traditional menudo than the place i found out here because mm. i love menudo it's not for everyone uh, if you know what menudo is you know why if you don't know what menudo is don't find out what's in it until you try it right yeah 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 it's one of those things. And if you see a pig's foot floating up in your bowl, it's the most authentic menudo you could possibly have, <laughs> and you'll love it. It's for the can't flavor. It is. Huh? You can't help you. I mean, my, listen. You, you... Just don't ask questions. Yeah, yeah, don't ask questions. <laughs> you got a lucky foot. Yeah. My wife my wife had tripas at a restaurant one time and she came home and told my mom that you know, I got I got tripas and they were so good. My mom's like, Don't you ever order tripas anywhere but you you, you want tripas, I'll make them for you. You don't go to restaurants <laughs> and order tripas, you could die. <laughs> my wife's like, What? No. <laughs> it's like fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a question about the GMs that you're looking for in the future. What mm -hmm. type of individual are you looking for? What would someone need to bring you? Like, is there a reel? Is there like a resume for TTRPGs exclusively? Like, what what is something that they, someone could give you? Adrian, so, Adrian no, just sh ask them what you no, want. not yet. No, I gotta be, I be professional. <laughs> <laughs> so I will tell you this: uh, most of the GMs that I that were previously on, I invited, and that's because they were already players in games. And I knew they GM'd. Like Ivy and and uh, Star Shard Stories, uh, Game Ready to Grow and Star Shard Stories uh, M, they both played in the Tuesday night World of Darkness multi splat game that we run. Uh, now, multi plat splat game just means that World of Darkness has all these different supernatural characters, but they all races, but they all kind of hate each other. Well, in a multi splat, you find an excuse where everyone can play whatever they want, and there's no separation. Mm, gotcha. So, so we, we so Ivy and um, M both played in that game. When I decided I was going to try and bring in some more content, but I didn't have time to make it, I offered... Ivy was always busy, so I offered it to M first, and M ended up, and M ended up running two games for us for a while, and then when I, like... I had some financial issues basically based around all this happened with this thing. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up having to stop paying GMs for a while. And M took the games that she was running and moved them to her own channel. That's what I meant. Like, we don't retain rights to anything except for the videos that are created on our channel. If you take the games and you take them to your own channel, then they're yours. You're, you, take, you can take the players. You can take the games. I even played on M's No Wait. No, I didn't. I was going to say, I thought I played an M's channel a few times, but I didn't because that, that was when I, like, my schedule went to hell. Um, so, yeah, and then Ivy came in a little bit after M did, and she also got, was still running her campaign when I had to stop running it, and she moved those games over to Dice Cream Sandwiches. And I stayed playing in that game on Dice Cream Sandwich because it was more in the regular time frame that I could make time to play in until the campaign ended. Um, and so, you know, that's just two examples of what we were trying to accomplish for people. Um, like Star Shard now runs a bunch of stuff on their channel, a bunch of different RPGs. And of course, you guys know who Game Raider Girl is. She's the CEO of the Crit Awards. So, <laughs> so yeah, she went on to do her own thing as well. Mm -hmm. And so we want to see, we love to see that type of growth that we might have had some help in helping to create. You know, um, I'm old. I love the concept of mentoring. I love the concept of, you know, I don't need to succeed in this particular industry. I succeeded in one that I, my, my own, that I, you know, that that's why I can do all this stupid stuff and still be know that I have money put away for retirement and everything like that. I never got to, except for some times in college when I managed a comic book shop, I never got to work in this industry, the gaming industry. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say this, there's one very good reason I never worked in the gaming industry. 
I had a family. And if anyone, everyone in the, your audience has worked in the game industry, it is absolutely almost impossible to support a family on what you make in the gaming industry. It is a love relationship. It is not a logical relationship. You know, so I had to make that sacrifice. I did not, I wanted my family to be okay. So I had to make that sacrifice of, I will never do what I love for a living. So, you know, that was, I pay the bills with the job that's my nine to five, but I also include dinner and a game in the bills until it supports itself, which is the goal. Yep. Yeah. Until I have a tote bag. <laughs> they get me. Listen, I, the good merchandise, listen, that mm -hmm. good, good KERA merchandise, ugh. Mm -hmm. Ugh. Say less. I like KERA a lot. I'm not a lot I actually get, I, I, uh, at 8.30 in the morning, KERA comes on my phone and just starts playing the, <laughs> the news. <laughs> I don't even get a choice that this comes on. No, I mean... My dad, my dad used to play it in the morning because he couldn't handle music in the morning. So mm -hmm. dropping me off to at the school uh, was only the news. And I was like, why are we, this is so boring. Oh my God. And then <laughs> what happened? If I had to drive to work in the morning before, you know, Spotify, uh, that's all I listened to because that's all I wanted mm -hmm. to listen to. Like first thing in the morning, that's it. Like, I don't, I don't need anything crazy. It's nice and mellow and chill and, like, direct and it's not heated. And sometimes there are fun pieces that are a little less doom and gloom of our government falling apart in front of our yeah. eyes. Um, and and it's, just, it's just a magical time. So what, you've got me sold into whatever Kool-Aid <laughs> you were trying to offer us um, in your community building. But patron of the arts. Like, listen, you are, you are above, you are just bringing back some like old, old school ideals where somebody pays the poor people to like do the thing that they love. You know, I just, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, and like I said, it, it comes into the mindset that we have with DAG of trying to be someone who supports the community. Um, yeah. And it's 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 weird to think about it that way because every time I hear and say that I think about all the TV shows you see of this rich snobby people going to the you know the the ball or the high end function that's supposed to be raising money for the the local library or whatever and it's just all these rich people walking around with you know all the people who would actually use the services they're raising money for waiting on them. Yeah. And I grew up as the waiter, you know, that's how I, that's how I survived through college and everything like that. And literally when I was building my career uh, in this industry and like I would work for some place for like two or three years. And because the industry was that I work in is so new, the, they were, the businesses were constantly once, if they did well, they get sold. And some other company buy it, and then we'd all get laid off. So yeah. I'd like spend two years at one place. It would do really well. It would get sold. I get laid off. I'd have to go to another place, spend two or three years there. The place would get sold. I get laid off. And so, like that's my first ten. That's my first six years in my industry was doing that. And then after the last time I got laid off, that's when I started doing my independent contract work, which I did for ten years, and. The reason it even started is because if I was like, if I'm going to have to be switching jobs all the time, I'm going to decide how much I'm getting paid and I'm going to decide where I'm going. And I actually was working as a field operative uh, when I got laid off the last time. So I'd already made all these contacts with all these people who used our services. And I just told them, I know what my company was charging you before I got laid off. They didn't make me sign an NDA. I'll charge you half that. <laughs> <laughs> you goofed. <laughs> yep. You goofed. So I, I basically started my own business. I did that 
from 2005 to 2015. And then I started getting recruited by headhunters who would, I didn't have to find my own contracts anymore. They would find them for me. I would just provide the services. So. Yeah. It was, I mean, that's, that's fortunate. It was an that's interesting fortunate. time. <laughs> yeah. It was an interesting time. It was very much feast or famine. I feel bad. Yep. I get a grant, or I try to, I apply for grants from the junior league, and mm -hmm. it's very much that vibe of like, oh, we've donated all this money to you peasant teachers, and we're so proud of ourselves, and then like, that's yep. it. It's just like you giving money away to feel good about yourself to people who need it, um, but like, it's just it's strange it's a strange it's a strange world we live in uh yeah, where I know. that's the case capitalist but, hellscape that's what we like to call it mm -hmm. fine yep and yeah and it's, it's magic like you are bringing magic to the world so thank you for sharing that no problem thank you <laughs> thank everyone else who shows up that's true i mean you gave them the space you gave them the sandbox and you could play accordingly yep <laughs> i will say this it is also because of what we try and do with DAG, it is also really frustrating when I see some of our games not get the attention I feel they deserve. Because, like, as, as the games that I run, you know, if we get, if I get 10, 15 people in to watch a show a night, I think we're doing fucking outstanding. And if I get, uh, you know, I've gotten up to like 80 viewers at one time and I was losing my mind. Um, but it is like the stories that we run and the amount of just life that my players breathe into the characters that they're playing. I want these things to get seen by anyone and everyone who likes TTRPGs. We used to go with an adage of anyone can play a game that feels to them like critical role looks to everyone else because it's not about the quality of how you do a voice or and it's not about the the how you how well you write a character background it is about how much you invest into the game you're playing and how much the story the other people at the table and the GM allow you to experience your character's point of view. So that's where that's where that's where you get the personal experience of being in critical role because your imagination will fill in all the gaps. You know what I mean? You don't need mm -hmm. the high value production 3D map on the table because um, your mind will fill in those gaps. Your imagination will create that for you. You will see that in your head. You know, I, I will have a little digital map out in front of you, but I guarantee that's not the scene that's playing in your head while you're thinking about the fight happening. You're thinking about, you know, we just had a big fight in the plane of fire, and uh, it was on a platform that was screened out with walls of fire all around it, and our barbarian jumped on a pit fiend and rode them into the wall of fire. So the barbarian was on fire fighting the pit fiend in the wall of fire. <laughs> And so I guarantee you, they were not looking at the round icon of the pit fiend and the round icon of the uh, barbarian on the pit fiend standing in a wall of fire. That's not what they were seeing in their head. What they're seeing <laughs> in their head is some scene from an anime with fire all around two combatants, burning them as they're fighting and them hacking at each other. That's what they're seeing in their head. So, you know, yep. you do not need to be critical role to have that experience in any way, shape or form. Yep. What got you into TTRPGs? The Lord of the Rings, when I was ten. No, <laughs> I read the I read The Hobbit for the first time when I was in first grade, mm -hmm. um, and it was like on the the adult kids reading levels. But I saw the cover, and I begged the librarian for like two weeks until she let me check it out. And then I read The Hobbit when I was in first grade. Um, I talked my mom into buying me The Lord of the Rings the next year. I read everything Tolkien wrote, you know, by the time I was out of second or third grade. And mm -hmm. then in fourth grade, I did a book report on the Cimmerillion. <laughs> that was a nightmare. Um, 
And I just plunged down the whole fantasy table from that point on. You know, I have, like, behind my head, that bookshelf. Eh! Eh! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this this bookshelf right here, from this side to that side over there, this is one quarter of my reading library. The rest of it's in my bedroom and other shelves. So, yeah. you know, I used to belong to the Science Fiction Book Club, and I was one of the few people who actually bought the book every single month. Because the way it's it's like the the, uh, the the old CD club where they you know you get twenty si CDs for free you only had to buy ten through the year and but you know it was like, I think you got like six books for free and you had to buy like four during the year or something like that but I bought them all you know every single book that came in every single month I never sent them back I always just kept them yeah and paid for them and it was just did like and them? I did you read yeah, them I read everything I could I would I would literally be reading four to five books at one time. Mm -hmm. yeah there would be a book in the bathroom that was my bathroom book there would be a book by my bed that was my bed book there would be a book by the couch in the living room that was my living room book there would be a book in my car that was the book I read whenever I got trapped somewhere and there was a book in my backpack which was if I'm walking around going places I had a book to read then too I tr I, tr I have one book and it's just always just traveling with me in my backpack and I'm like, if I get lost and usually it never happens but when I don't have that book in the backpack I'm like, I could have had my book right now. Yep. yep. Adrian, so, um, you balance that by having the Libby app on your phone. Oh, so you I, mean, I don't read enough to... to get the Libby app. <laughs> what do you mean you don't read enough to have the Libby app? Adrian, I... I read I got... one book last year, and I read a lot of anime this year, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I have, uh, I used to, when I, when everything, when I adulted, mm -hmm. when I, when you know, was starting to actually work full-time jobs and not just going to college and stuff like that, um, when I did that, I switched over to audiobooks. And I'm old enough that when I first switched over to audiobooks, I had to go out and spend like a hundred bucks for get, to get 24 cassette tapes. <laughs> Hell yeah! And so you know that was that, and that was how I got my audiobooks. And then like now, I don't have it anymore just because I don't even have time to listen to audiobooks anymore. Mm -hmm. But for the longest time, I was a subscriber to not Kindle but the other thing. Audible. Uh, Audible. Yeah, I was a subscriber to Audible. And, like, I have, I don't think I still have my Audible library on here, but I have, like, something like 140 Audible books. I share my Audible account with my, my wife now, but she doesn't, she doesn't ever want to listen to books. She wants to read them. She likes, yeah. she's a big time, I want my hard copy. Hell yeah. That's fair. That is yep. fair. Yeah, because, like, whenever we buy gaming books, I always buy the physical copy, but that's not for me. It's for her. I use the digitals. I'm just going to mute. Too many things going on right now. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's my main thing is I'm always going to have too many things going on because I'm <laughs> ADHD. You know, Rude I don't, thing. I don't feel good unless I'm in a total state of panic. <laughs> I don't. I used to, that's when I was true. younger, I used to say I loved chaos. I only mm -hmm. felt comfortable when I was in a state of chaos and I learned I didn't get diagnosed with ADHD until I was 50. Yeah. And I basically learned that that's why I needed all that stimulus just to be able to think straight. I could only focus when I had all that stimulus coming in from all different re 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 uh, directions, eliminating my ability to be distracted by anything because there was too much shit happening. And then I could pick one thing out of that shit and focus on it. Mm -hmm. So. Extremely, severely ADHD. <laughs> like right now I'm talking to you guys. I have three screens in front of me. I have eight tabs open on my Chrome browser. I have my email open here, my Discord over here. Um, <laughs> I have the Disney Channel waiting in the back to restart the Alkalite because I haven't finished watching it. Uh, I've been responding to Discord messages from other people. And uh, what else? I think that's all I'm doing right now. We watched The Acolyte for the plot. And that plot is so good. Yeah. <laughs> the Acolyte is really good. 
I, I told my wife because she was asking about it, and I was like, the Acolyte is almost Andor good. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah. But also, so. dear listener, the plot um, is not necessarily the story, just so you also know. Yeah, the story is it's great. how so the like, plot affected all the characters that are involved. No. Well, yes. Alex's yes. plot is a certain something. Oh. I don't know what because I have I don't have Disney Plus. It's but does it look the like a tiefling? A <laughs> does it look like a tiefling? Is it? Is it? No, it's not. A, no, no, no. Where are I you? I watched it. I'm thinking of Carlac or Carlac kind of character in in Acolyte. I don't know if it's there. No, Acolyte is. It's going to be. Re- I I love the whole. Con- I don't want to give away spoilers, but I love no the worries. whole concept. No. I saw the villain man, though. But... It, it came up on my Tiki Talk. You mean the plot, Adrian? You is that the, the plot? plot? Okay, I okay. That is the plot. Okay, my bad, my bad. That's the plot. <laughs> it's yeah, also cha- it's also changing canon in the in the Star Wars universe, so people are going ape shit. <laughs> my canon. No. My canon. It only oh, mattered no. right now. It only mattered. I, right I always now. say this. I always say the same thing. If you care about canon in an RPG, you better write your own world, and you better be the only person who ever plays in it. Because I guarantee you, in every single other game master's world, if they play like Forgotten Realms, mm-hmm. their Forgotten Realms doesn't have anything to do with canon the moment they start introducing players into it. Because your right. players will fuck with your world. And it'll change things from canon. Like, the Walking Dead game I'm running is set with all the video game stuff and everything like that up to 2010 is canon. But from 2010 on, we're going to fuck it all up. <laughs> <laughs> we're playing in New Orleans. New Orleans was the focus of, like, the second Walking Dead game. Mm-hmm. And it, it was uh, a video game, that is. And it was... The, the Telltale? Uh-huh. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it was uh and so there's a lot of characters in there and like one of the characters in there was he's a major character in the story but he's kind of like not really in the game. But well, we just mm-hmm. killed him. Yeah. And it hasn't even come time for the game to take place. The video <laughs> game. So we just killed him. So, yeah. yeah. It is what it is. Well, technically he killed himself. Mm. Yeah, he got shot all up and they were coming to check on the body. And so he had Last ditch, last ditch thing, because he was a spiteful, horrible human being. He held a grenade to his chest and pulled the pin, and he was holding it like that. And when they flipped him over, he just let it go. No. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Until the end. Oh yeah, yeah. He he nearly killed two PCs. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. One of them had a piece of fence driven into their abdomen. Nice. nice in a, in nice. a time period where you know you had to fight to find just penicillin. Yeah. Walking Dead is so fun. Oh god, it's terrifying. I got horrible. lucky and played with uh I played with Geek Girl Lissa mm-hmm. and uh North Wolf as mm-hmm. the the storyteller. So, yep. it was a fun time. But I'm excited to see what happens at Gen Con cuz I'm trying my best to just like see people cuz like I'm not going to be able to visit everybody. But since they're already going a lot of people are trying to do things outside of Gen Con. Mm-hmm. I'm excited to see those people and meet up and and do whatever because we don't. I don't have a structured plan. What do you? What do you? What, what what's up, Alex? I just realized your question was never actually answered. Uh, mm-hmm. Ray, uh, uh, for oh, yeah. GMs in the future, uh, what can Adrian? I mean, just general GMs in the future, but also oh, oh, Adrian oh. do to uh, help himself get on your get on your on your dinner table. Uh, number one. Uh, the biggest thing I always look for is uh, how much the GM values their players. Sorry, Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, no, no. I don't mean I don't mean by like trying to keep the players alive or anything like that. My focus on that is I see a lot of GMs out there who are like, I want to tell my story. I want to tell my story, and as a GM. My job is not to tell my story. Mm -hmm. My job is to take the story that I want to tell and shape it to all the backstory and everything else that the players have created. Adapt my story to fit that. 
and allow the players to drive the storyline and the plot with their own decisions, their own actions, and to influence it and take it in the direction that they want to take it. And then I just adapt my story to that. That should be the focus of every GM. If you come in and you have, I want to tell this narrative, this is the narrative that's going to get told. Not only are you going to railroad your players and force them to make choices, or actually just take away their choices, but you're also going to be devaluing what the players bring to your game, which is their personal points of view and their points of view from their characters as individuals. And you're taking all that effort that the players put into being a part of your game and just saying, yeah, that's nice, but that's not what I wanted. Mm -hmm. If you want that type of storytelling, write a novel. I actually made a GM cry by saying that. Well, I mean, I'm sure it was a white man, so it it's was. fine. Mm -hmm. That feels like white man behavior. I'll be yeah. real. He's like, but what about my story? And I was like, dude, if you want to tell your story that bad, write a fucking novel. I'm so I was sorry, like, if Alexander you want... Hamilton. <laughs> if you want, if you want to tell, do ensemble storytelling <laughs> with a group of people who have agreed to spend their time helping tell a story, that's what role playing is. Yeah. And my big thing about that is, and in Houston, I ran or didn't run. In Houston, I was part of a group that did a. Uh, uh, an RPG set up in a game store and it was, uh, um, what is it? It's from, it, it started with forgotten Realms, So, but it's a type of GM style where the GT GMs, the players create the plot, the GMs create little nuggets. And then the players go through. And as the GMs run the games, it opens up new NPCs because the GMs create them on the spot type things. And it develops stories. And then the players get together groups, West marches. That's what it is. Which marching game. the players will get together groups to go explore the plot lines that they technically created. And so, and the GMs are just there administrating the storylines and trying to link them all, get, get back together in some single meta meta story that can encompass all the craziness and give it focus and direction for the main plot. Like that's how we develop our, G, our, our bad BBEGs. It's like the players really liked this narrative about this cult that worships a Kraken. So now we're going to make a BBEG that's a Kraken and he's going to talk, he's going to attack the town for some, the, the, the port city for some reason. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and then we just put out a bunch of new narrative clues for them. The players form their own groups to go chase them down and you just adjust the level based on your player group. And so it was really, really cool, but it was also the best example of player driven plot because it was not just the players driving the plot for their individual group. They were driving the entire plot of the world because as they followed trails, the GMs would create the scenarios coming forward from those trails. They'd be like, okay, I had to create this NPC because they were, they got the, you know, I dropped these clues. They managed to trace the clues back. And I decided I would have to make this fence who knows these people who were getting them the components they needed for this ritual. And they tracked down the fence. So now they know where they're getting their components from. So here's the fence. Here's his name. Um, I figure he's a fucking warlock or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. and then I just throw him out there and I was like, you, you can adjust him for whatever level you need. If people are going to confront him, try not to kill him, try and let him get away because they're going to need him. If we kill him, then we'll make his twin brother back for revenge. I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, and that, that's, and that's all we did. We had a discord for ourselves that we kept all the running notes in, but you know, that's, and that's some of the best games we had. It was a West Marches game, and I think at the highest point, <laughs> regular players, we had nice. 80 people playing that game. And that we, had like, we had like 10 GMs. Mm -hmm. But one of the GMs, one of, we, we would do GM auditions. Like, I had to audition when I came mm -hmm. on to that thing. We would do GM auditions, and I remember one, the person, I, I was sitting at a table for a GM audition, and I remember this person showed up, and they didn't have anything ready. They were just wasting our time it was horrible the game itself was terrible 
and I was livid. Mm -hmm. And I went outside to talk because after the after that round of games were done, all the GMs, the regular GMs, stepped outside, and I was like, "That person will never ever run in this ever." I was like, they did not respect the fact that people were spending time out of their fucking day to come here and play a game. They did not respect the fact that they were taking responsibility for the quality of day this person was going to have from that point on. And, as, and they didn't respect the fact that the time that these people were giving up can never be returned to them. You mm -hmm. only get the time you get. And that's why I said GMs who want to tell their own story... That is one of the worst things I can th I can think of you can do to somebody is disregard the fact that they are sacrificing their time to help you tell a story and mm -hmm. you're going to disregard their input. Mm -hmm. mm -mm. So, yes, respect players above everything else. And then, you know, just make sure that you are focused on finding the overall plot that you can make out of the diverse narratives that your players are All going to bring to the table. Respect players. I always say that I have a web or a meta in the background for all my games. And it can be as rough as, I want the bad guy to be a super intelligent goldfish. <laughs> but that's the source. And then the characters are going to make their character backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And then, like, someone's dad disappeared. Well, their dad was on the city watch. Well, the city watch was investigating this crime spree. The crime spree is being organized by, you know, this criminal organization that was in the thrall of a mind flare. Mm -hmm. And that mind flare was under the employee of this intelligent goldfish. And so I map my plot back to their personal storylines. And their father was investigating the plot and the mind flare ate him. But now the player's father's memories are all inside that mind flare. Papa. Yeah, I, and that's I just made that up right now. So, yeah. But that's the type of thing you know that I want to see from people who want to run in DAG is you have to be able to respect your players, respect the time, and you have to be able to that's make intense. your story that that's you because you can have a story, like I said, but make the story you want to right, tell right. be adaptable enough that you can bring in the narrative choices okay. that the players are making into it as an integral plot device. That's about it. If you can do yeah. that, you can tell a fucking amazing story. So I don't need to worry about anything else. Oh, yeah, and don't be a racist and don't be an asshole. Oh. Uh... Fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> I just eliminated uh... myself. God. Oh, no. No. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Okay. Sounds good for those who want to you <laughs> yeah. know, be a GM for DAG in the future. Um, not anyone I... There might be somebody I, I know. No, nope, I don't know. Anybody. Maybe. <laughs> not anybody here. Well, like I said, um, <laughs> we're probably not going to be able to bring on any more GMs until the beginning of next year because we want to see how the fundraiser goes. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that anyone who wants a chance to try and do something like that you need to help us promote dinner in a game so we can get more money in so we can pay more people. You know what I mean? Uh, just imagine yeah. I'm paying, I just, I'm paying Ren's invoice right now and he ran two games for us and I'm paying him 240 bucks mm -hmm. for the two games he ran. Nice. That's 240 bucks out of my pocket. Right? Mm -hmm. right. So let's just say that happens every single week. So mm -hmm. for a month, I'm paying out a grand mm -hmm. just for Adrian. For Diamond, I'm paying out, I see, brain not work, do math better, 200, 360 bucks a month mm -hmm. if for, for, for four weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there's two. Um, I'm going to be incorporating myself into this. Because the reason I'm doing that is because all the game slots that I currently run, as I step back, there's going to open up for other players. So I have to have that budget already in place so I can mm -hmm. replace myself with other game masters. And our ultimate, ultimate, ultimate prize goal is mm -hmm. to be able to pay everyone. Pay the GMs, pay the players, 
And the reason for that is, like we said, dinner in a, at dinner in a game, real life comes first. If you're on the payroll, we're now part of your real life. Mm-hmm. That's so sweet. <laughs> All right. So, any last questions, Alex? No. no. Thank you. Thank you, Ray, for sharing sharing everything. Sharing that what's behind the screen, if you will. <laughs> yeah, a font of information. Oh, yeah. Gosh. It just comes from being old. <laughs> that's that's uh, I guess that's the trade off. I I can't run anymore because my knees are so decrepit, but I mm-hmm. know a lot of shit. <laughs> all right ray where can they find you uh you can find dinner in a game and twitch under the dinner in a game and everywhere else under dinner in a game um because some bastard on twitch has been sitting on dinner in a game for five years and they're not doing anything with it and i hate them actually i don't hate you i wish i knew who you were and i'd pay you for dinner in a game <laughs> um but uh, yeah, and, dinner, and then at Twit uh, on Elon's Hellscape, we're dinner under bar game. So, but everywhere else, we're dinner in a game. Um, we broadcast Mondays, Tuesdays, uh, Fridays, and Saturdays. Um, I run Monday, Tuesday, and Friday, and Renown runs on Saturdays. Uh, but we're that's going to probably be changing soon. Hopefully, we're looking at moving some things around. And like I said, um, keep an eye out for our fundraiser in September. So we can budget everything out, because like if I if we can get the entire budget made, that just means that I can start bringing on more content creators sooner. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? If we don't make the entire budget, yeah. then I can't I can't I don't pay myself, so right. I can't replace myself unless I have the payroll in place to pay someone in that slot. Mm-hmm. So if it comes down to it and we don't make the budget then whatever we don't make budget for i have to continue running in those slots i mean yeah that's the trade-off mm-hmm. <laughs> and all right that's that <laughs> dear listeners thank you so much for joining us on another episode of dungeons and degrees you can find us wherever pods are cast so be sure to reach out to your friends families and enemies and share our podcast with them you can also find us on all social medias at Dungeon, One Singular Dungeon, uh, the letter N, as in never eating soggy waffles, and <laughs> degrees with the S at the end. Uh, you can find us on, you can email us if you ever want to be on the show. You can email us if you want to yell at us. You can email us if you want to send us money. I will take all three options. Um, you can also find us on Patreon, so go on and help us there. We will also be at Gen Con, because I'm going to assume this episode comes out before we leave. Um, so if you see us at Gen Con, come up and say hello. Maybe bring some cookies. I don't know. Whatever you feel like. Maybe don't Remember, have anything if you cookies. bring cookies, you're confirming you're on the dark side. That's true. <laughs> That's true. And you know what? For Manny Jacinto, I will be on the dark side. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for listening. My name's Adrian. And I'm Alex. And I'm Ray. Go have some fun. <laughs>